Tom Barry brought a column of 38 men, only two of whom had previously seen action to kill Michael, a barren limestone hilltop between Don Manway and Macroom, at eight o'clock in the morning of the 28th of November, 1920. He posted them in different sections along 200 yards of this mountainy road that we're standing on now. And when the Tans arrived at five past four, the first lorry was engaged 200 yards away from where I'm standing now, downhill. The second lorry was engaged at this spot and when they had been defeated, the auxiliaries offered a false surrender. When the volunteers came out to accept the surrender, three volunteers were shot dead. But the auxiliaries had omitted to observe that there was another section of volunteers lower down the road. And they, led by Tom Barry, came up and annihilated the remaining auxiliaries at this point where the memorial to the Irish volunteers now stands. Looking at this spot now, 45 years afterwards, the first thing I remark is that even though this side is practically unchanged, over here, I'm glad to see a wood has been planted and it indeed looks a very, very different place to the place that the 3rd Brigade Flying Column came to on that rather fateful Sunday. This new British terrorist force had been in Dublin and in Mead and they had rampaged through the country for about four or five months before they came to McCroom Castle. And <laughs> during that time, they had burned towns, destroyed creameries, killed old men and old women, and looted all in front of them. And they came down here and occupied McCroom Castle. And from McCroom, they seemed to have a very, very keen wish to come south into the West Cork Brigade area. And for four or five previous Sundays, at various hours, these fellows came, two lorries, sometimes three lorries. And when they got down to the south of us here, they diverged at various places, different directions. One Sunday they'd go east, another Sunday they'd go west, and another Sunday they'd keep going south. Consequently, these fellas had to be met in a place where we weren't too near to McCroom or Dunmanway, and at this side, the McCroom side of this cross where they diverted on previous occasions. And the two nights before the ambush took place, we came, I came along here on horseback and selected the position with the vice commandant of this battalion, named Mick McCarthy, who was the following Sunday to die on these rocks here. And <laughs> this position was not an ideal ambush position. And as the column were told, either they got out of it or the other fellows went out of it, that these guys wouldn't take any prisoners and either the flying column would win or they'd be wiped out. And I have been blamed, I suppose, with good reason for putting green men into such a position which entailed hand-to-hand -hand fighting. But there was probably something to be said for my decision, justice to myself, I have to say it, that this ditch of the road fighting was the only fighting that suited a weak people fighting one of the greatest empires in the world with all their resources. And with men like these Oxies, who were all commissioned officers and had served in one or more fronts throughout the war, and who had plenty 
target practice, plenty of arms and plenty of ammunition and barracks that they could retire to. Now, <laughs> it meant, and I knew it, for one anyway, that if they came, a decision would be taken. And <laughs> either we won or we lost. Either they won or they lost. And <laughs> when we were marching here the night before, it rained for the 12 or 14 miles in us. And the men got in here at 8 o'clock in the morning. And it was dark then as they came here, and they took up their positions. Now, there were three, there were four main sections. There were 36 men, as Seamus O'Kelly told you, in the column. And we didn't know whether two lorries would come or three lorries would come. Therefore, the first thing to do was to detach one section of seven men and send them 400 yards towards the McCroom side so that if more than two lorries came, that they could open fire on the third and hold them while the remainder of the column was dealing with the first two lorries. Now, <laughs> we had planned that we'd fight from one side of the road in all these engagements that we had. And the reason was that in the crossfire, men would be liable to be killed by their own, the fire of their own comrades. But here was a lot of rocks and rough country, and there were no ditches on the road here. And therefore, after sending the insurance section, if we'll call it, out here to stop any more than two lorries and hold them while we were dealing with the rest, we had to prevent these fellows from making the rocks here where they could fight and fight from. And accordingly, seven men under Stephen O'Neill, who I'm glad to say is still alive, uh, they occupied those rocks along here. And their instructions were to keep these fellas from getting into the rocks and engaging us. Number one section then was down behind the big rock. And there were 10 men on that. Then number two section was up here, and there were 10 men there. And the command post was behind the wall, the little wall there facing the auxiliaries as they came. And their job, there were three picked men there with the column commander. And their job was, as soon as the column commander blew a whistle, threw a bomb, or opened fire, they were all to join in. And these three men, their duty was to pick off the driver, make sure of him. They were in crossly tenders. Anyway, <laughs> This this number one section, which was behind that big rock, was to take on with the column commander and three big men, the first lorry. These were to take on the men here under Battalion Vice Commandant Michael McCarthy were to take on the second lorry. And as I told you earlier, the insurance section was to keep the road clear for us and not leave any more rain till these had been dealt with. That sh disposed of our 30 men that was left after sending the insurance company out, and these fellows here, those here, this section, that section, the other. We arrived here, as I told you, dark in the morning at 8 o'clock. It rained all night as we marched. And uh, we got here without anybody knowing it. We came across fields and through boreens. <laughs> and the men were soaking wet. And in that last Sunday, November, in 1920, the day started to freeze on them. And from 8 o'clock in the morning, they were in their positions, and they weren't allowed to lift their head 
case they'd be observed. And they had no food. They got nothing except some decent people on this house here sent down uh, one bucket of tea and a basket of cake to them. But anyway, they lay there all day, and it freezed hard. And their wet clothes were quite stiff. And they waited and waited and waited. And just about 4 o'clock, before it got dark, I had more or less decided to withdraw that they weren't coming. And it was an extraordinary thing that I said, I'll give them 10 minutes more. And in that, after four or five minutes, these fellows were signaled to us coming along. And <laughs> just when they were signaled as coming along, along came six men from the Skull Battalion on top of a sidecar. And they're quite unconcerned about these oxies. They were only a half a mile behind them or so. And I came up the road and shouted at them, get up the boreen and out of the way and gallop. And the grey horse galloped. And they went up, got out of sight. And they were just out of sight when the first lorry came on. I happened to be wearing uh, volunteer officers, IRA officers, uh, uniform coat, pants and leggings. And I had the usual equipment, map case and revolver belt, Sam Brown, that kind of thing. And when the first lorry came along to us, they saw me standing in the ditch, and they slowed. And they were obviously puzzled as to who this officer was. And they may have thought for a minute that I was one of their own. But anyway, they kept coming along slowly and slowly until they came within about 30 yards, and they were going about five or six miles then when a bomb was thrown at them. <laughs> and a whistle blew, and fire was opened, and the scrap was on. Then the first lorry zigzagged drunkenly down to where we were standing. It came to rest within three yards, four yards of the command post. And those are the Uggsies that weren't killed or wounded. There was a couple of them killed, I think. They all leapt out on the road, and the fight was on. And the fight then became more or less a hand-to-hand -hand fight. And it was a bloody fight. It was a bitter fight and a savage fight. But eventually, anyway, nine of the Aggies lay killed on the road, and there was no surrender from that bunch. <coughs> At this time, we had only one man killed. And the second lorry had come to rest down here about 30 yards or 35 yards from where number two section was. And they were fighting back and engaging the section. And the column commander and three of the riflemen came up the road, jogging up single file here. And we had gone to about 100, 100 yards or 120 yards down when <laughs> I heard these fellas shouting, we surrender, we surrender, we surrender. But we kept jogging on to them. And we saw them, some of them throw their rifles away. And when they did, three of this section stood up. And two of them, the Oxys opened fire immediately on them. And they killed the two of them after surrendering. They killed them with revolver fire. They threw their rifles away, and they killed them. They were a short distance, 20 yards from them. They killed them with revolver fire. When they opened fire again, we kept jogging up, and we were not recognized by this second lorry of these fellas. 
And we got within 30 yards of him, we dropped, and I gave the order to fire. And, and I shouted at the same time to the section, keep firing, and don't stop till I tell you. So these fellows, some of them turned to us, but eventually, after four or five minutes, uh, we had killed a lot of them. They tried to surrender again, and I said, don't take any surrender, and I want here and now, publicly, <coughs> to take full responsibility that we wouldn't take prisoners after they, their false surrender and after killing two of our men. <coughs> I only regretted one thing, and I'm speaking now almost 45 years after it, and it was that I hadn't warned these men of this false surrender trick, which is as old as war itself. Be that as it may, anyway, <coughs> these fellows were all eventually killed, and <coughs> we took their arms, took their ammunition, took their notes, notebooks. We left them their money and their brandy flasks. And we pulled them away from the lorries, their dead bodies. And <laughs> we set fire to their two lorries just as it was getting dark. One down at the command post and one up here. <laughs> 